Whenever you have an invented universe in television or film, one of the most important things is your look, your style. Even if you have a huge budget, you can't really build the Starship Enterprise. You cannot really build Starfleet Command. But what you can do is you can suggest it and the audience's mind fills it in. So how do you do that? And it turns out that you pick a style, you pick a particular color palette, a particular way of shooting things, a particular way of doing your visual effects, a particular way of telling your stories, and that becomes your style. And once you've defined that, if you've defined it well, if you believe in it, if your stories believe in it, the audience will buy into it. Literally, the first meeting that I took with Roddenberry said, you know, how are you, how are you gonna do the visual effects? Because even though 87 was, we think of it as a dark age as a visual effects, but in fact, it was post Star Wars, post Tron. So the bar for visual effects have been raised so much compared to what they had done on the original Star Trek. When you have a big visual effects project, like a movie or whatever, it's common practice to have what they call a bake off. And that is you go to a number of houses and you say, this is what we're thinking of doing. And give each company a list of your requirements and say, how would you do this? And that becomes their bid to say, how would I approach your show? It's an opportunity for a company to shine. It's an opportunity for a company to show what its artistry can do, and it's an opportunity to be innovative. You gotta remember when these tests were done, when the Bake Off was done, they didn't have a design for the Enterprise D yet. They had to use feature material for their template, for their guideline, and so you're talking about not only cutting edge CG effects, which were kind of all over the map in style, depending on from company to company, some used paint box. You could look at one enterprise and then look at a different enterprise. One might have been a little bit better than the other, but it was a particular style. In 1987, CG effects were beginning to come of age. The problem was the visual effects industry at that time, everything was handcrafted. The computers were almost literally hand-built. The software was, was tailored for that particular machine. So you didn't have the ability to simply add another computer. You didn't have the ability to go to another facility. And for something like Star Trek, that's a problem. And of course, because everything was custom made, if the company that did your visual effects got in trouble for whatever reason, they went out of business or they took a big job elsewhere, you're in a bad place. The results were actually quite interesting. You saw a really wide range of approaches. Some of them to present day look almost laughably primitive but they show that it's not always about getting the best possible visual effect. It's about getting the best possible work given the constraints of your time, your budget, and the current technology. And so you have companies doing things that seem almost simple today. They, they, they are simple, but depending where the budget fell, this may have been the most cost-effective approach. If you look at the tests, there's quite a range of technology and, and techniques used. In fact, some of the paint box effects are actually pretty close to what they ended up doing for the phasers and, and such. Some of those CG enterprises, I think they still hold up quite well today. And it just, just shows the dedication of, the, of those people and the power of Star Trek. They wanted to work on Star Trek. I still can't get over the fact that you know what schedules are like and production is like. It's crazy. And if, oh my God, if something had happened, if they were going CG and something happened, uh, they had a massive crash of their computers or there was a virus that took out the technicians, the artists that were sitting there. I mean, they had a different kind of virus. What, what would have happened? It would have been catastrophic. I applaud the fact that they were thinking out of the box, that they were thinking forward, that they were thinking about CG. I mean, that's, but it just wasn't ready yet. I mean, it just wasn't there. And the look of Star Trek is so identifiable. I mean, you fast forward to the future, to the end of Deep Space Nine, or the Voyager, which is CG, it's a different time and different place. Star Trek has always been on the cutting edge of visual effects. You look at the very first Star Trek series, uh, the use of film opticals and miniatures and matte paintings, that was bleeding edge back Brilliant. then. Nobody did that. And yet they, they used the best tools they had to take us into the future, to take us into the final frontier. The problem is from a filmmaking perspective, it has to be reliable, it has to deliver on time. You cannot have surprises. You cannot just say, this is gonna be a week late because you have an air date. So you're always trying to balance you want to be cutting edge, it has to be reliable. Physical miniatures, motion control photography, blue screen effects, all these things had been used in feature films. So the technology was pretty well developed. It was a, it was a good decision, it gave them a great look. 
And model photography is a known substance. I mean, it's a known, it's something you can quantify and qualify and plug into a budget. I mean, yes, you're going to have heavier episodes, you're going to have lighter episodes, but can you imagine on the time deadline that you had to complete your post. The CG approach probably would have worked for the first season where you basically had a library of about 20 or so uh, ship shots. But later on in the show where they started to get more and more ship action, episodes like Best of Both Worlds, Yesterday's Enterprise, that would have been problematic. Not just the time to build the digital assets, but the render times. Back then, they were using what they considered to be supercomputers, and most of us have more powerful computers on our desktop now. Or in our phones. <laughs> that Enterprise still looks great on screen today. CG on that scale, on that schedule, on that budget, just wasn't there yet. When you're talking about CG effects and you're talking about visual effects houses of that time period, at least I think immediately of ILM. I mean, they were the A-team. They were the people that you really wanted to come to your project. But they were very busy, and it was really a stroke of, of luck that at the time that Star Trek The Next Generation was gearing up, they were doing the pilot, ILM actually had some time. And so they were able to shoot visual effects for the pilot of Star Trek The Next Generation. Not only did you get great stuff, but you also got the name on your crawl at the end of the episode, which I thought was awesome. Well, I think that the studio had a great relationship with ILM. They had been working on the movies for them. We needed a good model built and they had built other ships. And the idea was, let's have ILM build the model and we have all these other models that they've already built for the feature films that we can use. Let's have them help us with the pilot. The original uh, 1701D Enterprise, which we received from ILM, they constructed it at ILM, was a very sophisticated model for its time. My understanding was it cost approximately $75,000 to have constructed. It had very complex internal lighting systems and very elaborate animated elements in the foreground of cells and all that. When we received it, the first thing that struck you was it was gigantic. The saucer was an oval, and so it was very wide. It was made of fiberglass and, and aluminum framing, and it was constructed in such a way so that the saucer could separate from the main body. So it was a very, very heavy model. It took anywhere between four to six people to pick it up off of its stand and reorient it for any of the shots that we had to do. So it was very, very heavy. In addition, it was very complex. It had 14 separate high voltage neon light circuits in it, which I had to rig every time we went to shoot it. And I wish I had a dime for every time that, that sucker shocked the bejeebers out of me <laughs> when we'd go to plug it in or unplug it uh, because we get an arc from that high voltage source. And anyone who works with neon will tell you that it's very easy to get electrocuted. And it had 14 different power supplies which I built onto a cart so that we had a little cart that we could chase the ship around with and it had wheels under it. Every time the ship would rotate or, or we'd be on a mover and it would move down a track, and one of those things pulled out, you'd get an arc about three inches long that would light up the whole room. <laughs> so it was, uh, it, was a lot of, it was a lot of hard work and very fastidious work to make that model uh, function properly. When The Next Generation began and we started working on the pilot, the decision was made, like so many television shows at the time and features as well, is that a set number of stock shots, of visual effects of the ship shots would be created and then those would be used for the whole series. And we'll have 28 stock shots, that'll be plenty we'll be able to do the whole series with those stock shots. Each one of those shots ran into the tens of thousands of dollars a piece. What the studio wasn't quite clear on is that that didn't include compositing. So knowing that they were gonna be dealing with a constrained budget and a constrained schedule because it's just episodic television, what they're gonna do, they're gonna shoot the series on film, they're gonna composite the visual effects in video. Today, that seems short-sighted because now CBS Digital is having to recomposite everything. But in fact, it was a brilliant decision. Had they gone with traditional film opticals, it would have taken them weeks. And the budget was going to stay the same. So going with, with film opticals means simply you have less visual effects. And the visual effects are simpler. And you don't have as much time to tweak them. So the decision to go with video compositing, it wasn't digital back then, was brilliant. And I think it's a, a key reason for this ultimate artistic success of Star Trek The Next Generation. Yeah, I mean, you could put so much more on film. What we saw from Star Trek The Next Generation, and it kind of set the way things looked and the way that you do them, uh, came from that basic decision.
we could streamline the process and it became something that I felt was doable and it became a very exciting prospect for me because I could implement all these these new technologies and see if it would work really. Once the studio committed to a video finish I felt that it would not only be possible but it would be very exciting to be involved with it. ILM obviously you know shot all the separate passes you had to have physical models and you had to shoot them with motion control. Motion control is a system is an industrial system that moves the camera precisely along a programmed pathway so you can shoot multiple passes and each image will match the previous position for each different pass. For instance, we had a, what we would call our fill pass, which was just an even illumination around the model so that we had everything exposed so we could fill in light. And then we had a key light pass, which was shot separately, and then a light pass, all the internal lighting. Now, most of the shots had more other passes, interactive light, multiple light passes. So many of the shots had at least five to to 10 passes on them. But they were shot in a wide format that could only be transferred at one facility in Los Angeles. <laughs> we had done some tests. This company, CIS, that I knew about was very innovative and they were working with pin registered transferring of film elements so that you could composite on video. To layer multiple elements together, each element had its own film weave. Our company was the first company ever to integrate optical pin registered movements into the uh, film telecine machine. That's what the film perfs are, are for in film, is they allow you to register each frame one to another. That was for each pass. You could layer things as they would in uh, film opticals. One of the biggest time consuming elements of shooting white mats or white light on cards was that all the spill would fall on the ship and you had to place elaborate blackout cards all the way around it to prevent it from lighting up the ship. With black light, you could allow the black light to fall as much as you wanted to on the ship because we would filter the light that was going in through the lens. We used UV filters that would block that light. So even though when you're standing next to the model, and if you look at some of the images that we had from that time, you'll see the model looks like it's a brightly lit with blue light. It was actually black to the camera because it blocked out all that UV light with the filtration. But the orange screen was emitting light in a different spectrum, came up, and it was very even exposure-wise and very bright. So it was very fast and easy to shoot the mats that way. VistaVision was created uh, kind of as a poor man's approach to 70 millimeter. It was a camera that was set on its side, and the aperture, instead of exposing four perfs, of, of film which is 35 millimeter, it exposed two frames at a time. Uh, ILM at the time was using it to shoot all the elements for the, the pilot. Since we had developed the pin registered for 35, we also fitted it with the VistaVision movement, so we uh, also were the only ones to be able to transfer VistaVision film to videotape. And each frame would take up to two to three seconds to image for each single frame. We took the live input from the telecine and we would take the ship elements, we would transfer those just as individual elements. The ships, the mats, the lights, the, the nacelles, the engine glows, all of that were shot as separate elements on a motion control rig. And we would transfer them all pin registered so that when they were combined together, there was no shifting between elements. And they went to a company that had an database set up where they could gang 20 machines together and pass them into a switcher and roll them all at one time. Analog suffered generation loss. Every level that you went, every re-recording degraded the image. What ILM basically did is they basically set the style uh, of our space effects. If you watch the show as it goes on, you'll see CG starting to creep in as early as the episode Daylor, where Rob and Gary used a CG crystalline entity and then later on uh, more and more little pieces happened. But it wasn't really fully rendered CG ships until 2001 with uh, Enterprise. It's true. Because of that, Star Trek always has sort of been the history of visual effects. 